Revelations 4, verse 8 says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for your creatures Oh, for you created all things, and by you, your will, they exist and were created. You know, sometimes in our lives, we might wonder, we might question, we might not understand if this is true, depending on situations. Something might have happened, but there is truth that one day we will stand before God, and in all his glory, we will understand and we will know for a fact that holy, holy is our God. He is worthy of our praise. So as we praise him this morning, let's go ahead. As Don come, we're going to sing, Holy, Holy, Lord God Almighty. Let's stand, please. We lift our voices. as we bow before you, we thank you and praise you that you are our God. Lord, we thank you that you are on the throne of this universe. You are a holy God, a righteous God. Father, we know we can trust you to do what is right. Lord, we praise you that you are also a loving God, that you know and love each and every one of us. And Father, we just ask that you would accept our worship this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and all that he has done for us in providing for our salvation. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells us as believers. Lord, today, as we worship you, we pray that our worship would be acceptable in your sight. 
Father, we come to you as a needy people. We've mentioned some specific prayer requests. And Lord, we ask that you administer to each of these. Minister to each and every person who is even now silently lifting the requests of their heart to you. We know, Lord, that you know us, you love us, you care for us. Minister to us not only today, but throughout the week. May you receive the glory for all that is said and done, for it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All for a thousand tongues to sing. All for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come into your house and worship, to magnify your name, realizing that you are a God who is sitting on the throne and who's ruling in, in our hearts and our lives, and one day you will in person be here and rule. And what amazing time it is to see you in all your glory. You know, as we are here on earth, we just ask that um, we just give back to, what, uh, to you what you have given to us. We are so thankful for what you do in our hearts each and every day. As we're about to receive the gift, we ask that you will bless the gift and the giver. And we pray this in the name of your Son. Amen.
until Let's stand please I see. 
is the glorious promise that he cares for me. Amen. Don't we have a great God? Aren't you glad that he knows everything that we are going through, have been going through, will go through? He loves us. He cares for us. He's at work in our lives. Thank you so much, Tim. And I trust the song service this morning has been an encouragement to you as we have worshipped our God. Let me ask you, do you ever have trouble remembering things? I have to admit that for many years, I've had a tendency to be a bit forgetful. Even back when I was in Lima, I was a lot younger then, I'd frequently set something down in one of our offices or in the copy room of that church. Later, I'd forget where I placed it. I didn't really realize I had set it down. Maybe my keys, maybe something else. And I'd have to go retrace my steps and hopefully eventually find that item. For a long time, I have made it a habit of carrying three by five cards in my pocket. Someone says something to me that I need to remember, an idea pops into my head, I can jot it down and make notes to myself. But again, sometimes I forget to look at the notes. I carry a pocket calendar and I'm trying to get used to using my phone as a calendar to keep all of my appointments. But again, very occasionally, I have missed an appointment because I forgot to look at my calendar. Now, I don't think any of those symptoms are signs of anything serious. In fact, because I've had them for so long that I don't, I don't think I'm going anywhere with it. But I think those symptoms are pretty common. We have so much to keep up with in our busy, hectic world that honestly, it would be kind of abnormal if you didn't forget something now and then. Now, maybe it's because of my own forgetfulness, but I've developed a habit of reminding other people of the things they need to do. And I hear my wife giggling. I think sometimes it drives my family crazy when I say, did you remember to? Or don't forget to. Am I getting a hearty amen from the front row? Yeah. But while forgetfulness and reminders can range from humorous to somewhat annoying to very important on a personal level, they can be very serious on a spiritual level. Various forms of the word remember or memory or remind are found about 300 times in our English Bible. In fact, forms of the word remind are used three times in the four verses we're going to look at this morning. So take your Bibles if you would, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. In your bulletin you will find an outline for today's message and uh, I hope it will be a help to you. I don't want you to be offended but this morning I need to ask you could I remind you of something? That's really the theme that Peter is developing in these four verses. Now, as I thought about this passage and studied this passage, I really debated whether there was a full message here or whether these four verses should be included with the remainder of chapter 1. When you're preaching through a book of the Bible, you have to decide how big of a chunk, how big of a section you want to look at. I finally came to the conclusion that what Peter shares in verses 12 through 15 is important and we need to study it separately from verses 16 through 21, which Lord willing we'll look at next week. We don't know for sure, but it's very possible that Peter wrote this letter to the same group of Christians that he wrote the first letter to. They lived in several cities in what is modern day Turkey. They were facing some very severe persecution. And that's the theme of the first letter. In this letter, Peter is challenging them concerning their spiritual growth. Then he will, in chapters 2 and 3, devote a significant portion of this letter 
warning them of false teachers and scoffers who deny Christ's return. Peter opened this book by challenging these Christians to diligently work at growing in their faith. The closing verses of this chapter will teach us some important truths about one of the key tr tools that will help us to grow, and that tool is the Word of God, the Bible. But here, between these two vitally important themes, Peter sh shares some personal words about himself and about his purposes in writing the letter. His purpose was to remind them of some things. So this morning, let me ask you, could I remind you of something? Follow along as I read. We're going to begin our reading with verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it right. I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Remind. Reminding. Remember. Three times Peter uses a form of the word remind. So this is a passage about reminders. What does Peter tell us? Well, first, I'd like you to notice the paradox of reminders. Look again at verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. I'd like you to think about the paradox of reminders. Now, you know what a paradox is, don't you? According to the American Heritage Dictionary, a paradox is a seemingly contradictory statement that may nevertheless be true. This verse contains a paradox. We'll notice that very clearly in just a moment. As we look at verse 12, I want to approach it a little differently and develop, rather than develop it word by word. We're going to begin at the end of the verse, then we'll look at the middle, and finally we'll come back to the beginning. So notice first from the end of the verse that there is truth. You, are, uh, you know and are established in the present truth. The word translated present in our English language is an adjective. In the Greek language, it's a verbal participle. It's a word that refers to something that is present with you, something that is, is at hand, something that is at hand continuously. So what Peter is saying is this, there is such a thing as truth, and it's right here with you. It's at hand. It's available to you. That is a very important point in today's culture. There is such a thing as truth. Now, Pastor, why would you make such an issue of that? Well, let me go back a number of years. Someone in our church came to me and told me that one of our Christian colleges was having a debate about whether there was such a thing as absolute truth. And I said, oh, you've got to be wrong. You, you had to have misunderstood. But the person was right. One of our conservative Christian colleges had started drifting down a road of questioning whether you could know truth with any certainty. Fortunately, that college has now turned back around and has straightened things out. But there is a huge debate going on today about whether truth even exists. Folks, let me tell you, there is truth. And this truth is available to each and every one of you. But Satan does not want you to believe God's truth. So I want to start by thinking about a couple of forms of denials of truth that Satan uses. Denials of truth. I'm, I'm going to group these under two different headings, all right? The first heading deals with modernism and false religions. If you compare truth to a compass, and if you say that truth is due 
north. Then obviously going due south would be falsehood, would be a lie. False truth. Modernism is a philosophy of life that has been predominant for many years. Modernism tends to deny the supernatural. It all but worships the scientific method. Only those things that are observable and reproducible exist. So modernism, if, if God is this way, may lead to atheism, the denial of God. It may lead to agnosticism. We don't know if there's a God or not. Can't prove he exists. It may lead to the idea of a God who is distant and not at all connected and involved in our lives. Modernism resulted in humanism. In humanism, that philosophy says man is the measure of all things. The only things that are true are those that man can determine to be true. The only things that are important are those that are important to us as humans. Now, Satan has used modernism with its promotion of false truth in many ways. Back to our compass illustration, we started with this. If God is found by going due north, then the opposite, going due south, would be atheism. There is no God. And Satan tries to keep us from God by convincing a lot of people that there is no God. That's one of the reasons evolution has become so popular. If this world, if life on this world, if our lives just happened by chance over time, then we don't have to acknowledge a creator. And if we don't acknowledge a creator, we don't have to acknowledge that he's going to judge us someday. But let me tell you, he will. And you know, that approach works with a lot of people. But Satan uses other tactics. You will never go north and you will never reach God if you head east or west. So Satan uses false religions, false philosophies. Whether we think of Baal in the Old Testament or the goddess Diana in the New Testament or Buddha and the many Hindu gods today, False religions, false gods have been used by Satan throughout history to deny the truth. Many billions of people have been and are being deceived by false religions and false gods. There's another approach that Satan uses. If the goal, again, of knowing God is due north, and that's just an illustration, you understand that, right? If, if going due north is the only way to find God, then you can still miss God by going a little northeast or a little northwest. You don't have to go 180 degrees in the other direction. You have to go 90 degrees in the other direction. You just go a few degrees, just a degree or two. If you're flying a plane and your direction is off just by a couple degrees, if you're going far enough, you're not going to get to your destination. Satan uses false or perverted so-called Christian religions. Things that go under the name of Christianity, but don't believe in the true Jesus of the Bible to keep some people from the truth. Think about it. Even just a little bit of rat poison will make your lovely cake unfit to eat. Right? Right? Beautiful cake sitting there, but oh, by the way, one of the ingredients I put in was rat poison. Not for me. I wish I had some more time to develop those thoughts. We don't. For many, many years, Satan has denied the truth through modernism, through false philosophies, through false religions. Recently, Satan has taken a different approach. That approach is something called postmodernism. And we're not talking about post toasties or you know, some kind of post-serial. Postmodernism, the thing that comes after modernism. Postmodernism denies truth by saying there's no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is relative to you. You may have one truth, I may have another truth. We both can be right. We don't have to argue and make an issue over which one of us is correct. You can believe in Jesus, that's great for you, I'm glad it helps you, but that doesn't mean that I have to believe in Jesus. 
I can believe in something entirely different. It can be true for me. What's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me, and, and that's fine. Now, that's a gross oversimplification of postmodernism, but that's basically what postmodernism says. It's kind of a live and let live. Follow what works for you, but don't expect me to follow along with you. I'll follow what works for me, and we can be happy together. You've seen the bumper stickers coexist with all the different religious symbols. That kind of thinking is what's involved in modernism. We can all get along. We can all believe what we want to believe. We need to be tolerant of one another. The only ones we cannot be tolerant of are those who have the claim of absolute truth. In fact, postmodernists will say we're absolutely certain of one thing, and that is that there is no absolute truth. Satan uses various means of denying the truth. He may say truth does not exist. He may try to replace the truth with a false so-called truth. Those are the basic denials of truth. Let's take a moment to think about some demonstrations of truth. We're talking about the fact that there is truth with a capital T, absolute truth. Where do we find it? Well, let me share four places where we can find truth with a capital T. The first three are the three persons of the Trinity. God the Father is truth. Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him, speaking of Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Deuteronomy 34, 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. God the Father is truth. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is truth. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples in verses 16 and 17, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. God the Father is truth. Holy Spirit is truth. Jesus Christ, the living word, is truth. John 14, 6, familiar verse. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 1. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Revelation chapter 19, as everything is being wrapped up, verse 11, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Each of the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the living word, are true, are truth. There is such a thing as truth, and we find it with God. The final demonstration of truth is the Bible, the written word of God. One of Jesus' requests in his high priestly prayer is found in John 17, 17, a very important verse. Jesus prayed, sanctify them. Make them holy, set them apart for your use. Praying for the disciples, praying for us. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This book is true. This book is truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, the Awana verse, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Psalm 119, verse 160, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I have taken a long time on this first point, but it is so important in today's society to realize there is truth, and you can be confident of it. Have you ever faced someone who believes in evolution, and they say, well, what the Bible has is just myths? They're wrong. 
What the Bible says is truth, and you can rest on it. There is only one truth, and that truth is true. But Peter goes on to say more to these Christians in the verse. Secondly, he assures them, you know the truth. Look again at verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Now, remember, Peter is writing to believers. Peter is writing to Christians. A Christian is someone who knows the truth, and he has placed his faith, placed his trust in that truth. Now, what is it? What, what is that truth that every real Christian believes? Well, it starts with the fact that God is holy, but we're sinners. We have all said things, we have done things, we have thought things that fall way short of God's perfection. We are sinners. God is holy. The next truth is because God is holy, he must judge our sin. Our sin has separated us from a perfectly holy God. We deserve nothing other than eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. That's the bad news. But the next truth is the good news. God is absolutely holy, but he is also absolutely love. And because God loves us, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die in our place and pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus Christ is truly the eternal God, God the Son, who came to this earth and became a man. He is the God-man, God in flesh. He, as the sinless Son of God, took our sin upon himself, died in our place, rose again, and now he offers the free gift of salvation. It's free to us because Jesus paid for it on the cross when he shed his blood and died. The final truth is that we must accept that free gift by faith. We must know the truth in our head, but we must also accept those truths with our heart. Saving faith involves believing in our heart. All that I just said about accepting Jesus Christ, but then we must actually place our faith in him, accept him as our only savior. Head knowledge is not enough. It involves trust. It involves faith. In James 2, James, the brother, the half-brother of our Savior, wrote this in verses 17 through 20. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What he's saying is, real faith is a faith that changes your life. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. James's response, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted, built up in him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Then he gives us a warning, beware, lest anyone should cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. Be careful in that public school, be careful in that secular university that some teacher, professor does not pull you away from the truth. Be established, be firm in it, and live it. So Peter is actually praising these believers. They accepted the fact that there is truth. They knew the truth. They were established in the truth. But here comes the paradox. This is where we've been going all morning. They still needed reminders of the truth. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how well you know your Bible. Peter tells us that we still need reminders of the truth. Look at verse 12 one last time. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Adding the word even, even though you know and are established in the present truth. Three times in these four verses, Peter talks about needing to remind us. He says it in verse 2, in verse 13, again in verse 15. 
And these are constant reminders. When he says, I will not be negligent to remind you always, he's using the present tense, which speaks of an ongoing regular activity. And the word always means perpetually, incessantly, over and over again. That's Peter's purpose in writing. He's writing to remind his readers, to remind us of some important truths. It is a common desire of mankind to want to hear something new, something unique, something novel. Peter warns us, I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul warns us about people with itching ears who only want to hear myths and fables, not sound doctrine. But God's plan is to teach the truth and to remind God's people of established truths. Let me give you an example from Paul's ministry in Athens. We find this in Acts chapter 17. I'm going to begin reading with verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them that Jesus, he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine of, of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange thing to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. And here's the conclusion. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. Paul had something new to tell them because they didn't know the truth. But when we know the truth, stop looking for new things. The truth is found here. We don't need something new. We need to know we need to fully understand. We need to apply the truths that God has given us. Dr. Kenneth Gangel was a distinguished professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. In, one of, in a commentary, he wrote this about this passage. A problem in many churches today is not that believers do not know what God expects of them, but they either forget or, un, or are unwilling to live out the truth they now have. That's why we need reminders. There is truth. You know it. You're established in it. But we still need reminders. We need to hear it over and over again. So we'll continue to believe it. So we'll put it into practice. That's the paradox. Let's look at the urgency of reminders. Look at verse 13. Yes, I think it is right. As long as I'm in this tent. To stir you up by reminding you. Peter says, I think it's right. The New American Standard, I consider it right to remind you. Reminders are right. They're the right thing to do. Peter says that reminders are needed to stir us up. That, that's a word that was used of waking someone out of sleep. You know, every now and then I hit the pulpit like that just in case somebody happens to be sleeping. It's just kind of fun to see somebody come back awake again. Peter says, I'm giving you these reminders to wake you up, to stir you up. Peter's telling us sometimes we need awakened out of our spiritual drowsiness. He said it's good to hear the old truths again. It's right to be reminded of things that we already know. Peter goes on to tell us that the time for reminders is now. Look at verse 13 again. Yes, I think it's right. As long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. The time for reminders is now. Peter was motivated to write because of his expectation of death. According to Bible scholars, at this point in his life, Peter's probably in his 70s. 
Historically, Nero is on the throne. Persecutions have started. From history, we know that very shortly after this, Peter was going to be executed. According to tradition, they were going to crucify Peter, but he refused to be crucified like his Savior, so he was crucified upside down. How did Peter know that his time was short? Why did he have this expectation of death? Well, at the end of verse 14, he tells us Jesus had shown it to him. Some scholars think that Christ may have given him a special revelation that his time was short. But many look back to the final chapter of John's gospel. Remember, Peter denied Christ three times. He went out and wept bitterly. But then in chapter 21, Jesus, after his resurrection, restored Peter. Listen to the prophecy that Christ gives in verses 18 and 19 of John 21. Jesus is speaking, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, you are going to die for me, but follow me. Peter was motivated to write this letter because of his expectation of death. He really wasn't wanting to say anything new. He wanted to remind them of things they already knew. Think about it. If you knew you were going to die soon, what would be some of the last things you wanted your friends and family to know? What would you want to tell them? That's what Peter's doing here. Now, that brings us to an interesting sidelight in this discussion. We're talking about the importance of reminders in God's Word. Don't just go out looking for something new. Stick with the truths of God's Word. But Peter, in this passage, gives us his perspective on death. In these verses, we find a perspective on death. First of all, in verse 14, we find that it is a firm appointment. Peter, in verse 14, tells us that he knows he must shortly put off this tent. Now, we'll discuss that phrase in a moment. But what Peter is saying is, shortly, I'm going to die. He knows it will come. He knows it will come soon. It is a firm appointment. The author of the book of Hebrews, in chapter 9, verse 27, wrote this, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, and then the sentence goes on, Psalm 90, verses 10 and 12. The days of our lives are 70 years. Some of you are well beyond that. And if by reason of strength they're 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Then verse 12, so teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Young people, you don't even have a guarantee of 70 years. James 4.14 tells us, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We all have a firm appointment with death. The problem is, that appointment's not written into our appointment book, into our calendar. We don't know when it will happen, and that's probably a good thing. I'm glad I don't know. But it is a firm appointment. Years ago, when I was a youth pastor in Chattanooga, we took our youth group to a local cemetery. And we asked them to go around and read the tombstones and see what they could learn about death. Now, that would be an interesting thing to do sometime. Some of the things that they learned was everybody there had died. And the ages, the, the, the dates of their death were all over the place, but the ages at which they died, there were babies buried in that cemetery. There were old people buried in that cemetery. There were children. There were teenagers. There were young adults. There were moms and dads buried in that cemetery. We have a firm appointment with death. Are we ready 
to keep that appointment? Are we ready to face God? As he talks about his coming death in verses 13 and 14, he tells us it's like packing away a tent. In verse 13, he says he's in his tent. The old King James uses the word tabernacle. He's talking about his body. In verse 14, he talks about putting off his tent. Peter is looking at his body and comparing it to a tent, a temporary dwelling place while he was on this earth. We live in a house. Most of you live in a house. Sometimes you live in an apartment. Most of us don't spend all of our days in a tent. There are nomads that live in a tent because they're not going to stay in this place for very long. They're just here temporarily, and then their flocks or herds need to be moved, and they're going to move their whole house, their tent, somewhere else. That's the picture. Peter says, my body is just a temporary dwelling place while I'm on this earth. In John 1.14, the Apostle John used that same terminology about Jesus. He said, the word dwelt among us. The word dwelt there is the word tented or tabernacled. He stayed with us for a short period of time. He lived among us temporarily. Folks, these bodies are not eternal in nature. And some of you who are feeling some of the aches and pains of this body are thankful that you're not going to live in that body forever. We've got a glorified body that's coming. When we die, we pack away the tent of this body. We lay aside our earthly dwelling place. In verse 15, Peter describes death as a departure. The end of verse 15, Peter uses the word decease. Not too often do I tell you the actual Greek word. It's only when it kind of makes something sensible to us. The word that Peter uses here is spelled E-X-O-D-O-S, exodos. That word from Greek went into Latin as E-X-O-D-U-S, exodus, the book in the Bible. It's a compound word that takes the word for a way, a road, a journey, and puts a prefix meaning out. So it's the road out, the journey out. A number of recent translations have used the term departure. It's interesting, Jesus, Luke used that same word of Jesus when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke 9. It came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, James, and John, ah, Peter was one of them, went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. His robe became white and glistening. Behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, his death, his exodus, his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That's this word. It's a departure to go out or the way out or the road out. It's interesting. Peter uses the opposite of this back in verse 11. Look at verse 11. Peter says, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's that same word for road or way with a different prefix that means into. Instead of exodos, it's isodos. To go in. So Peter's perspective on death is that it is a firm appointment. It's like packing away a tent and it's a departure from this world so we can live in a better world. Peter in this passage is telling his readers that it is time for a reminder. We've talked about the paradox of reminders. Even though we know the truth, it's good to be reminded anyway. We've talked about the urgency of reminders. Peter says, I'm nearing the end of my life. I've only got a few more things I can say. This is what's important. And it's not something new. It's a reminder. As we wrap things up this morning, let's briefly consider the legacy from reminders. Look at verse 15. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease, my departure. Peter knew his time on this earth was short. 
So he leaves this legacy. There are two things we need to take note of here. First of all, we need to remember that teachers will not always be present. Many pastors who have had an impact on my life are now in heaven. Some of my college and seminary professors are with the Lord. Many of the theologians whose textbooks I used in Bible college and seminary are with the Lord. Peter's saying, I'm soon going to be with the Lord. Teachers will not always be present. But folks, God's word will always be present. Peter wrote these letters so his readers, including us, would be able to benefit from his teaching after his death. First and second Peter are part of God's inspired word, and God's word is eternal. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Peter, in, this cha in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, says, But the word of the Lord endures forever. And he goes on, now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. The reminders that Peter left in this letter, in his first letter, are still helping us today because they're part of God's eternal word. Sometimes it is good to be reminded of some things. And those of you who have been saved a while have studied this book, have read this book, Sometimes it's new to someone because they haven't studied it before. In today's passage, Peter's asking us if he could remind us of something. When you get saved, everything is new. There's a lot to learn. You need to study the Bible. You need to learn all you can. But after you've been saved for a little while, you become familiar with a lot of the Bible. You, you've studied many Bible passages. Folks, we still need to study those same passages, hear them taught, hear them preached, because we need reminders. There's more truth from these passages that we need to learn, and there's a lot of truth that we need to be reminded of so that it'll impact our lives today. Don't ever be disappointed when a pastor or a teacher asks you to turn to a familiar portion of Scripture. We need those reminders. And if you are here today and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, let me remind you, you have no idea, you do not know, you cannot know how much time you have left on this earth. Eternity is forever. People die at all ages, at all stages of life. Let me plead with you, why don't you accept Christ and his salvation this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these reminders. We thank you that your word is true. When you tell us something, we can believe it, trust it, stand on it. When you tell us that you made us, we know that you did. When you tell us that Jesus died for us, we know that he did. When you tell us that one day we're going to stand before you, we know that that's going to happen. Father, I pray if there's someone here this morning that has never yet trusted Jesus Christ, that your spirit would touch that person's heart, draw them to yourself. Lord, I pray for the many Christians that are here today, that these reminders would challenge us to stand strong on your word and to share your word and your love with others. May you be glorified, Father. Help us to see, hear, understand, and live your truth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close our service this morning with a couple verses of open my eyes that I may see. Make this your prayer of your heart. Lord, show me what you have for me for your word. Let's stand together, please, as we sing.
open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silent so much for worshiping with us today. I'm glad you were here. Let me encourage you to be back tonight. We're going to be looking at the first chapter of the book of Revelation as we talk about Jesus Christ. Deacons, we need to have just a brief meeting right after the service. God bless you. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is truth. Help us to study it and know it better. Help us to live it better. Help us to share it with others. And again, Lord, we pray that if there's someone here that has not yet accepted the truth of Jesus as their Savior, that today would be that day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All hail King Jesus. All hail King Jesus. Thank you.